the scriptures are a testimony of the person of the Christ. They are they which testify of me. Look at the Bible as a book, not books. It is one book that carries the story of the Christ. The mission of the book called Bible, the scriptures, is to give us doctrine. Second Timothy 3.15 That from a child that was known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God and they are profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof which is evidence, for correction, and for instructions in righteousness. So the scriptures are given to build up the evidence of the Christ. To bring us to a place of correction. Now that word correction has to do with mindset. Mindset. It has to do with a paradigm. That the scriptures are given to, to get us to a place where our mindset is corrected. On our impressions and on our belief concerning the Christ. So Jesus said, they testify of me. In Luke 24, 27 and beginning at Moses, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He is the message of the scriptures. The prophets prophesied the foretold. The gospel contains his manifestation. The epistles carry the message that he made available to the new creation, the born again man. That's the complete Bible. The Old Testament, the law, and the prophets, they foretold his coming. The Gospels contain his incarnation. The epistles carry the message or the revelation of the Christ that was not given to the Gospels. That was kept for the man that is born again who has capacity to receive an understanding of all of God. So God is no more a mystery. God's ways are no more a mystery. The mystery called God has been demystified in Christ. Satan is no more a mystery. The mystery called Satan in the Old Testament has been demystified by the revelation of Christ. When you see Christ, it is easy to know Satan. The only reason why you can't know Satan is when you don't know Christ. When everything is jumbled together, you can't make out who is functioning and who is not functioning. But when Christ is defined and revealed, it's easy to know Satan. Because Satan is anything that is contrary to Christ. I mean, it's easy. And the Old Testament couldn't handle that because the Old Testament people they didn't have the capacity and they didn't have what it takes to understand God. They had glimpses of God here and there, but they didn't have the, the truth. They didn't have the truth concerning God. That's why Jesus in John chapter 16 verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Next verse, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is calm, he will guide you into all the truth. That word, all truth, in the original text is all the truth. So in the New Testament, we have all the truth. We have all. That means there is no more mystery. We have all the truth. All the truth has been revealed to us by the spirit of truth. Let me take you further. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them whom he loves. Next verse. But God hath revealed unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. That means the spirit has revealed to us the deep things of God by implication there are no more mysteries about God that are not revealed by the spirit the spirit has demystified God Ephesians chapter 3 verse 3 how that by revelation 
he made known unto me the mystery. The mystery has been demystified. He didn't make known unto me a mystery. He made known unto me the mystery. There is no more mystery where God is concerned because that mystery called God has been revealed by the Spirit in Christ. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. John 1.18 No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father he hath declared. That is to say, it is my exclusive responsibility to unveil the Father. I am the exclusive and sole custodian of the Father. My job is to disclose the Father. To demystify the Father. Alright? John chapter 14 verse 7. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Meaning the father is no more a mystery. You now know him and you now have seen him. In time before now, no man saw him. But from now, you know him and you have seen him. Him who? Him, the father. Meaning the father is no more a mystery. Teaching tonight? Are you following? Yeah. Then look at what Philip said to Jesus. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father and he suffice at us. Jesus, stop talking like that. We want to see the Father. In fact, Jesus, if you show us the Father, we promise we will not disturb you again. Then look at what Jesus said to him in verse 9. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? I am the Father manifest. I am the Father revealed. When you see me, you've seen the Father. No man saw him before, but now you have seen him. And you know him. Somebody say with me very loud, I know the Father. I have seen the Father in the person of Jesus. Can I hear a powerful amen? Now, thank you, Lord. I say thank you, Lord. We've established that the epistles, therefore, are our mirror. The mirror of the believer is the epistles. If you want to know who you are, you look at the epistles. The epistles contain the mirror that reveals you to you. The gospels captures the man, Jesus of Nazareth. The gospels captures the man, the man, Jesus of Nazareth. The gospels captures the man, the only begotten son of God. The gospels captures the man, Jesus of Nazareth. That's the job of the gospels. So, the epistles, therefore, has a greater revelation than the Gospels. Because the Gospels are restricted to the man. But the epistles capture the entire, the entire picture of the fullness of God. Not just the man, but all of God. All of God. We know all of God in the epistles. In the Gospels, we know the man, Jesus of Nazareth. In the epistles, we know all of God. The maximum load of God unveiled in the epistles. The epistles reveals Christ in us. And us in Christ. That's the revelation of the epistles. Christ in us and us in Christ. You won't see that in the Gospels. You won't see Christ in us in the Gospels. In the epistles, we are in him justified. He is in us glorified. We in him, he in us. The epistles reveal who we are in Christ. And who Christ is in us. Who we are in Christ. And who Christ is in us. 
That's the revelation of the epistles. The epistles are not prophecies. The epistles are prophecies and promises fulfilled. I didn't hear somebody shout a good amen. And Sunday we began to talk about he that looketh into the perfect law of liberty. He not being a forgetful hearer but a doer. This man shall be blessed. The man continues to look. The man who just glances forgets what manner of man he was. But the man that continues to look into that mirror never forgets what manner of man he was. He does not lose a focus on his identity. The man who doesn't look long enough, he forgets what manner of man he was. And he can begin to take on labels that are not his. Hallelujah. When you got born again, you got a name change. If any man be in Christ, he's a brand new man. Hallelujah. Now let me ask you a very simple question. When you look at the mirror, who do you see? Talk to me, church. Who do you see in the mirror? You see a monkey? When you look at the mirror, who do you see on the mirror? You see yourself. You see yourself. You see? If you want to know how you look, what is the best place to check? the mirror so the word of god is our mirror meaning every time we look into the world what do we see we see ourselves which word which word the revelation of christ every time we look at the revelation of christ what we see in the revelation of christ which is our mirror is that we see ourselves in him when he looks at us, he sees himself in us. He is our mirror and we mirror him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17. Now the Lord is our spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Can we all read like a mass choir, everybody in this building? Verse number 18, one to go. But we all with open face beholding the glory of what are we beholding? So when you behold the mirror, what do you see in the mirror? The glory. Who is the glory? You are the glory. Because as you behold the mirror, you see the glory. And every time you look at the mirror, you see yourself. You don't have the glory. You are the glory. I'm teaching now. Say with me very loud, I am the glory of God. Say it again, I am the glory of God. That's what you are. When we behold the glory as in a glass, we are changed into the same image. Why are we changed into the same image? Because in our spirit we are the glory, but in our minds there has to be a paradigm and the paradigm in our mind takes place when we look at the mirror to see who really we are in the mirror. When we see who we are in the mirror, it starts correcting what we think concerning ourselves. I am the glory of God. I am the glory of God. I am the carrier of his glory. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Yeah. Beholding the glory in that mirror, we are changed into that same image. There is no veil on our face. We can look directly at Christ. What is the veil? The shadows. What are the shadows? The practices. The practices put a veil on our face so we don't see him. When we are romancing the shadows, we can't see the substance. To see the substance, I've got to take my eyes away from the shadows to see the substance. So we all with open face, meaning no more shadows, no more practices. So because the practices and the shadows are over, my face is open, I can see Jesus. I'm teaching now. As long as you're looking at the practices, you can't see Jesus. That's where the problem is. 
The problem in the body of Christ today is that many people are surrounded with the shadows that they are not seeing Christ. And the more we try to bring Christ to them, they can't even see him because you can't even see Jesus when the veil is on your face. We see the glory in the mirror. We see the new creation. The new creation is God's glory. Where is the new creation in this house? Lift your right hand and shout, I am God's glory. Yeah, the new creation is God's glory. The epistles, therefore, are new creation realities. The realities of the new creation are revealed in the epistles. In some churches, they do new creation realities as foundation class. No, the entire Christian life, the entire Christian life, till he goes to heaven, is built on new creation realities. It is not a foundation class. It is both the foundation class, the maturity class, the leadership class, and the continuity class till we get to heaven. New creation realities are the realities of the man born after the image of him that created him. It's not just uh, an intro class. It is the entire class. Everything we teach about who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you is new creation realities. And new creation realities are taught to the man that is born of God. Born of God, born of the world. The epistles are redemption realities. They are realities of our redemption. The epistles are salvation realities. They are the realities of our salvation, new creation realities, redemptive realities. They are all contained in that portion of the Bible called the epistles. And that is where you have all the truth unveiled in the epistles. Because the epistles is where Jesus said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. Somebody's not shouting hallelujah. Ephesians 1.16, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. It's not just ambiguous wisdom and it's not just loose revelation. It is wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You don't just pray for wisdom and revelation. No, you pray for wisdom and revelation in, in, in. Your wisdom and revelation should be in Christ, in the knowledge of Christ. In the knowledge of him. In the epignosis, exact, accurate, precise, complete, perfect, comprehensive insight of, of Christ. Where you have the accurate understanding of the Christ. 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance. There is the glory of his inheritance inside the saints. In the saints. The glory of his inheritance is in the saints. But you have to know it. Next verse. And what the exceeding greatness of his power to us word. Who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Which he wrought in Christ. When he raised him from the dead. And set at his own right hand in the heavenlies. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named not only in this world. But also in that which is to come. Can somebody shout hallelujah. Revelation wisdom in the knowledge. Somebody say in the knowledge of him. Now what is that word knowledge? It is the word epignosis. Epi and gnosis. Epi and gnosis. It means precise, complete knowledge of him. Complete knowledge of what? Precise, complete knowledge of what? When Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, when he called them fools and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken what did he say was a summary of all that the prophets have spoken ought not christ to have 
suffer these things and to enter where into his glory so the question now is that god may grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him so what is that knowledge of him search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life they are they which testify of me i am the message of the scriptures all that the prophets have spoken now what did the prophet speak the sufferings of christ now that's precise knowledge that's exact knowledge that's revealed knowledge the sufferings of christ and the glory that will follow yes that's the knowledge of him what what constitutes the message of christ according to all the prophets the sufferings of christ and the glory that will follow so when you pray for revelation revelation of christ is what the sufferings of christ and the glory that will follow full stop that's the message the entire embodiment of Christ is in two segments. Hello? The entire embodiment of the Christ is in two segments. What's the first segment? The sufferings of Christ. What is the other segment? The glory that will follow. That is what embodies the Christ. So when you pray for wisdom and revelation in the knowledge, the knowledge of Christ you will ever have, is the knowledge of his suffering and the glory that will follow didn't you realize that apostle paul after 30 years of ministry prayed a prayer that i may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings what was paul praying for revelation and wisdom in the knowledge of him what is the knowledge of him the sufferings of christ and the glory that will follow am i communicating yeah that's the knowledge of him that's the knowledge of him the epignosis of him now therefore when i have precise when you have precise comprehensive knowledge of christ when you come to revealed knowledge and when you come to epignosis of Christ you will not call yourself what God did not call you when you call yourself what God didn't call you you are still so far from revelation I am who God says I am I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. Who does God say I am? Righteous. Who does God say I am? Holy. Who does God say I am? More than a conqueror. That's who I am. My circumstances don't define me my position in Christ defines me it doesn't matter the economic situation in Nigeria it won't affect me why in Christ we don't get affected when you have the epignosis you won't call yourself what God didn't call you anybody calling himself what God didn't call him didn't look at the mirror well hey you didn't hear that anybody calling himself what God didn't call him didn't look at the mirror well and you cannot have epignosis until you look at the mirror well he that look at into the perfect law of liberty and continue it continue it when you continue the effect of continuing is that you will no more answer a name that does not agree with the name God calls you no more even in your dream you won't answer that name because now your entire being is enshrined with the reality called the new creation realities the realities of your true identity when the doctor says you are sick you tell him no it cannot happen you are not fighting the doctor you are stating what the truth is you are not you are not saying uh, no by faith i cannot be no 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 if you are still there you have not come to epignosis epignosis is settled knowledge that nothing can rattle 
Say you have cancer. It cannot happen. Excuse me. Can I have something to eat? You're not flabbergasted. They say there's disaster coming. You say, let me take a nap. You enter your bedroom and sleep. Because you know it cannot come. Because of you. Because if Jesus was to be where they say there's going to be a tsunami, he will sleep. He did it one time. He was in the boat. There was a storm in the sea and he was sleeping. It took Peter to wake him up. Master, carest thou not that we perish? He stood up and said, ah, perish? Where is that word coming from? Where did you copy that from? Perish? Oh, is it this little thing that you call? Shh, shh, shh. Hey, stop that. Why are you doubting? You lack epignosis. You lack wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I'm teaching good tonight. If you understand me, shout, I hear you. Yeah? You lack revealed knowledge. Because if you had revealed knowledge, you will not say what God is not saying. You will say what God is saying. Now, you will not also say something is futuristic that has happened. When you have revealed knowledge, you will not say something is futuristic that has happened. Let me give you an illustration. Are you in the house? You will not say, oh God, come and heal me. Oh God, heal me. No. God is not going to heal you. He already healed you. To be saying God heal me means you don't have epignosis. Epignosis in the knowledge of Christ means you have accurate knowledge of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. Now let me ask you George, who did he suffer for? He suffered for himself? So if he suffered your suffering, should you suffer? No. No. You won't call something futuristic which Christ has already done. If you have epignosis, you won't say heaven at last. You will say heaven at first. You begin in heaven, you continue in heaven, you end in heaven. The reason why you are thinking of a location somewhere where we are going to go call heaven is because you are still thinking matter. You are still thinking matter. When this body drops, when this body drops, your real man begins to function fully in the realm of the heavenlies, where you are now. What stops your absolute functioning in that realm is matter. And matter is subject to time and distance. You didn't hear that. Matter is subject to time and distance. With this body, I need nine hours by road to get to Abuja. Okay? Science has tried to see if they can interpret some eternal things scientifically. They didn't succeed well, but they tried. So, instead of taking nine hours to get to Abuja, science came up with a technology that can give my body speed speed so that I can make Abuja in an hour. You know, in Genesis before seen, heaven and earth were together. There was no demarcation. Heaven and earth were together. It was the sin of Adam that split the heavens and the earth because now a gulf had to be fixed between heaven and earth. So the death of Christ has brought heaven and earth together. So that's why when you are born again, you are seated in heaven. So when you drop this body, you will lose consciousness of here and function there. Where you are seated now. Who am I talking to? And that's why as revelation continues to grow, the revelation of Jesus continues to grow, we are going to begin to witness some kind of miracles the body of Christ has not seen before. It's revelation. 
to go into that realm called heaven, you must of necessity drop this body. Because this body was not conditioned to live in heaven. That's why mortality will wear immortality. The body that can live in the realm called heaven is immortality. And can I tell you something? Right now, you have that immortal body waiting for you. But you can't wear it until you wear this one out. And the wearing of this one out and the wearing of that one on is called, we shall be changed. It's called change in a moment. That means to wear it doesn't take time. It's just in the twinkling of an eye. Why? Because you are not far from the realm. You are already in the realm. But you are matter conscious. It will take revelation to get you out of matter conscious into eternity conscious. And when you start thinking eternity, miracles happen cheaply. I'm talking now. When you think matter, you find it difficult to get the miraculous. But when you think eternity, miracles happen easy. Because miracles are the intervention of the eternal on the, on the, on the mortal. When the divine interferes with the material, we call it miracles. It's only a miracle here because it's not common. Therefore, then, it is not a miracle. It is lifestyle. Can I bless you? How many of you know that all the blind people and the cripples and the deaf and the dumb and people that have one hand who are born again, but because of their limitation in believing for a spear part, they couldn't get a new spear part. They couldn't get a new eye, new ear, new hand, new leg. Those sitting on wheelchair, but they are born again. How many of you know the moment the trumpet of God sounds and their immortal bodies drop, and their mortal bodies fall out. When they wear their immortal bodies, those on wheelchairs will move out of the wheelchairs. Those with one eye will begin to have two eyes. Those without hearing will begin to hear. Because in the realm of eternity, it is lifestyle for people to be perfect. Yes, sir. Am I talking to somebody here? If you're understanding something, shout I hear you. It is lifestyle for people to be perfect. It's not strange. It is only in this realm that it is strange for people to be perfect because of the imperfection that goes with this realm. So say with me, by revelation, I will not call futuristic what Christ has done. Can I hear a good amen? Say by revelation, I will not call myself what God didn't call me. When you come to a place of epignosis, you will not call yourself what God didn't call you. You will not call something futuristic that has happened. You will not call something a promise that has already been fulfilled. And you will not call somebody else who you are. You will know exactly who you are and you will say exactly who you are irrespective of the circumstances because you are functioning in revelation knowledge. When they say everybody is sick, you say, I cannot be sick. When they say things are rough for everybody, you say, I'm not everybody. I am not everybody. I am not everybody. I thought somebody would say that very loud. I am not everybody. My name is not everybody. So if everybody is going down, know that I am not part of it. Why? I am a peculiar person. I am a... Peculiar. If everybody is going down, peculiar people don't go down. I'm a royal priesthood. I am a chosen, 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 chosen generation. Hallelujah. The knowledge of that is called epignosis. The knowledge of that is the glory that follows the sufferings of Christ. I prophesy over everyone here. As your amen will come like thunder, you will manifest this glory. 
somebody shout the greater glory say it three times the greater glory louder the greater glory one more time now listen two things will happen first of all you will know what is the hope of your calling that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of your calling what is the hope of your calling first corinthians 2 12 now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of god that we might know the things that are expensively given to us how much freely given freely there are things freely given to us and when you read the epistles you will find out all the things that are freely given to you of god Ephesians 1.18 That you may know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The riches of the glory. When he talks about the riches of the glory, he's talking about the wealth. He's talking about the advantage. And he's talking about the unlimited resources available to the born again man. The inheritance of the saints in Christ Jesus. Verse 19. The exceeding greatness of his power to us what we believe some preacher said somewhere that verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 1 has four most important words four most important words for what God did in Jesus when he raised him from the dead number one the exceeding greatness the hoopa balloon hoopa balloon that means to throw beyond target to go beyond to exceed power that is so available that if your target was to throw this hanky on this glass pulpit right here that was your target but because of too much power excessive power you went beyond you, you exceeded this was your target and but there was so much power that when you threw it instead of stopping here it stopped there that's the power inside you you know what that means no limit beyond to exceed to go beyond preset boundary to exceed the exceeding greatness of his power so as if the exceeding was not enough eh? As if the exceeding greatness was not enough. Kimana, he now added the exceeding greatness of his dunamis. Of his dunamis. Dunamis is self-producing power. Somebody say, I know the exceeding greatness of his dunamis watch this look at me everybody because i'm going somewhere the exceeding greatness of his power self-generating power that does not need assistance to walk okay according to the walking according to the walking the word walking there is the greek word energy so we have hope alone dynamis energy throw beyond target self generating power energy means something that is effective in displaying strength you know to display strength dynamis means self generating power that doesn't need assistance exceeding great means power that goes beyond limit all of these are different expressions of the power that is resident. Are you in the house? Of his mighty power. That word mighty power, there is a Greek word kratos. Kratos, C-R-A-T-O-S. Kratos means strength. So we have Hupabalon, we have Dunamis, we have Energy, we have Kratos. And all of these four realms are in the believer. 
Next verse. Which he wrought in Christ. It was wrought in Christ. That is the combo that raised Christ from the dead. That was the combo. When Christ was to rise, exceeding greatness of his power, according to the working of his mighty power, that combo, boom, raising from the dead. And that combination resides in the born again man. That's why if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwelleth where? In you. Tabola. Say with me, nothing dies around me. Say it very loud, nothing dies in my life anymore. Can I hear your amen? It's residing in the believer. It's not a feeling, it's a knowing. Some say, I'm not feeling it. No, you don't feel it. But you will see its effectiveness if you know what is going on. Exceeding greatness of his power. Residing in the believer. Hallelujah. 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 Toward us who believe. Somebody say, I believe. Therefore, the power of God that raised Christ from the dead is at work inside me. I didn't hear you. Amen. Amen. What the power accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand in the heavens. There are four events you must never forget. Four events. Number one. You must never forget where the word became flesh. John 1 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. You must never forget the incarnation of Christ. Number two, you must never forget the sufferings of Christ. The so this must be constant in your mind. You must never forget the sufferings of Christ. He suffered for three days and three nights. He became a cause for us. He died for us. He was buried for us. You must not forget that. Number three, you must not forget the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. When he rose from the dead, he said to Mary Magdalene, Don't hold me. I go to my father, your father, my God, your God. But go and tell my brethren, I am risen. He went to heaven, shed his blood. The shedding of his blood was himself. Redemption fully accomplished. He paid for our sins when he rose up and went to heaven. He appeared in the presence of God for us. Then he came back for 40 days. He even ate. After he came back, he ate to show he was still alive. And after that, he went to the Father. To do what? Now, before I deal with, with, with you, went to the Father. Let me tax your mind a bit before we close. How many of you have heard people talking about the second coming of Christ? Have you heard about it? You have heard about it. Have you talked about it? Are you expecting Christ to come back? Eh? Uh -uh. Are you expecting Christ to come back? He's coming back again. My Lord is coming back again. He went away and promised that he's coming back again. Oh, glory, hallelujah. I have fast forwarded the song. Did you sing that song? Have you ever sang it? Are you singing it? Will you sing it after now? No, wait. Be yourself. We all know, even me, that Jesus is coming again. And as I'm standing here, I'm expecting him to come. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. Let him come. He's coming. Oh, he's coming. He's coming back again. Touch your neighbor. Say, he's coming back. Touch your neighbor. Say, Jesus is coming back. But let me ask you, how many of you have had people call it second coming? 
Have you heard that? How many of you believe that is second coming? If you believe it, lift your hand up. Don't be, be yourself. No report card will follow you home. Lift your hands up. If you believe that his coming is second coming, the second coming of Christ. Let me see your hands up. Let me see your hands up. Praise the Lord. Put your hands up. How many of you believe it's not second coming? Let me see your hands up. You believe it's not second coming? Okay, which coming is it? Where did they get second coming? Is there any verse in the Bible that wrote second coming of Christ? Have you ever read that before? No. Actually, the truth of the matter is the coming of Christ will be the third coming. It's not second. He already came second time. The next coming is the third coming of Christ. What was the first time? Incarnation. Eh? Follow me, church. Incarnate. We're dealing with epignosis. We're not dealing with religion. This is epignosis. Okay, so let's stay with the book. The first coming was what? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was the first coming. He said, no man has gone to heaven, but he that ascended himself. Then he died. On the third day, he rose. When he rose, he told Mary, hold me not back. I'm going to my father and I will come back. Is that true? And on that day, they were in a room. After he has gone, they were in a room without window and door. He entered. What was that? Second coming. Then after 40 days, he now went again. They were looking and the angel says, what are you looking? They said, Jesus. He said, he shall come back in the same manner he's gone. Okay? So the next coming is a third coming. Is a third coming of Christ. Not the second. That's why when you hear religious statements, check them with the Bible. There are a lot of jargons going on in the body. People just say things because it sounds nice. Now, if you don't understand that, that's when you cannot understand John 14. If you don't understand that the next coming of Jesus is the third coming, that's when you cannot understand John chapter 14. Every statement you make concerning the Christ will affect your interpretation of scripture. That's what you've got to be careful. If the next coming of Jesus is second coming, then John 14 is a futuristic scripture. Put it verse 1 so that everybody can see. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, I go, I go to prepare a place for you. If you don't understand that the next coming of Jesus is the, is the third coming, you will think that the next coming of Jesus is the one that he is coming after he has prepared a place. And that will affect your interpretation of that verse. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. When he rose from the dead and went to heaven, he occupied a place called the right hand of God or the regency on high. But he didn't sit there for long. He said to the father, I have some people I promised to come back for. Let me go for them. They were in a room without a window and a door. And he entered. They say it's a spirit. He said, handle me. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. By that time he came the second time. He had prepared the place already. And by the time he came the second time, he gave us his life. And by his life, we are now seated in the place where he prepared for us. Where are we seated together with Christ? We are in the heavenlies, far above principalities and powers. So by his second coming, he took us to where he was. Where he is is where we are. What he has is what we have. What he can do is what we can do. We are in him. He is in us. No more, no less. Amen. Amen. 
Yeah. And, and it will take an understanding of the fact that the next coming is not the second coming but the third coming to be able to understand that this promise he made in John 14 was at his first coming to be fulfilled in his second coming which has been fulfilled. The first coming he came for us. The second coming he came for us. Huh? Hello? The third coming, he will come with us. Why is he coming with us? Because where he is, we are. We are in him. He is in us. So his coming will be with us. So how can you miss rapture? There's nothing like missing rapture. Deaconess, have you ever gone anywhere before and left your hand at home? That is, you kept your hand on the bed and say, wait for me, I'm coming. You don't move and leave your hand at home. We are the body of Christ. Some of us are legs, some of us are hand. How can Jesus leave his leg? So rapture is not a prayer point. Rapture is my birthright. Where he goes, I go. Where he is, I am. What he has, I have. What he can do, I can do. Why? I am in him justified. He is in me. Can your amen slap the devil? Christ in me. The hope of glory. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Say I am seated where he is seated. Say, all authority is given to him in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Say, all authority is given to me in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. I didn't hear your amen. amen. How I bless you tonight. Where he is is where you are. What he has is what you have. What he can do is what you can do. Glory to God. Ooh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I am in him. He is in me. Now, the fourth thing. He went to the right hand of God in the heavenlies. And that was when he was exalted and seated on the right hand. That was when he was given a name that is above every name. When he sat, he poured out his spirit upon all flesh. And during the 40 days, he opened up all these realities to his people sat down and poured out his spirit. What happened when he was exalted? You will not see that in the four gospels. You will only see that in the epistles. John 17, 3 and 4. And this is life eternal that they might know thee the only through God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. The glorification of the Father is the finishing of the work. The finishing of the work. John 12, 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have but glorified it and will glorify it again. Next verse. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it turned out Others said, an angel speak to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The sufferings of Christ... And the glory. He said, I have glorified before. I will glorify again. Then Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. How is he being lifted up? He is dying. He is dead. So when you hear people singing, lift Jesus higher. What they are saying is, kill Jesus higher. Again. Because to lift him up in Bible grammar means to kill him. The lifting of Jesus means death. And many Christians don't know that. So they sing, leave Jesus, let's kill him again. We don't kill him again. We are not lifting him. We are not lifting him. He 
was lifted by death. We don't lift him again. We celebrate his glorification. Did you hear that? It's like this song. I like the song, but the song is not correct. Jesus, we enthrone you. We proclaim you as king. Standing here in the midst of us. We lift you up with our praise. We can't kill him with our praise. That's the first thing there. The second one there is, and as we worship, build your throne. It's not our worship that built his throne. It's that he conquered Satan and rose on the third day that built his throne. The triumph was his throne. Thy throne, O God, is forever. Your worship can't build his throne. Your worship can't build his throne. Oh, that song that used to say, we crown him. We are not the one that crowned him. We crown him Lord of all. You didn't crown him Lord of all. He was crowned by his resurrection, by the father. The father looked at Jesus and said, your throne, oh God, is forever. The father crowned the son and gave him the throne to sit on. his people sat down and poured out his spirit 